are joining us here today for our talk. It's my uh, pleasure um, to introduce Marianne Chambers to you and Tony will be giving a, a more fulsome introduction in a moment. Um, but in the meantime, just a bit of a, an intro. Um, as many of you may know, at the vestry that we had at the beginning of March, St. George's on the Hill passed an anti-racism motion. Um, and part of that is for us to do a better and more intentional job of uh, education, self-awareness, and... and Hmm? Sorry, Michelle, I'm gonna suggest that everybody mute, um, mute okay. themselves. Yeah, so I'm just gonna click mute all and then you're gonna just need to unmute yourself, okay? I turn it off. <laughs> You're still muted, Michelle. Yep. Okay, now am I unmuted? Can you all hear me? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. Let's start that again. So we're uh, because it's a beautiful Sunday afternoon, uh, I am so very grateful to all of you who have um, logged on today. We will be recording this session to make it available to those who are not able to join us at three o'clock today. So in light of that, if you do not wish to have a gallery view of your face as part of the recording, what you can do is just go to, um, on my screen, it's the upper right, but um, you can choose to stop video and then that will simply blacken your screen so that we don't see you on the, the recording. So you can do that. Um, so as I was saying at the top, um, St. George's on the Hill introduced an anti-racism motion at our vestry. And part of that is about um, better education, self-awareness, messaging in the community and learning how to become better friends and allies um, to our black and indigenous people of color um, and other marginalized groups and racial minorities. Um, and part of it uh, today, we're, we're launching our very first talk by welcoming Marianne Chambers to speak to us on anti-racism and changing the narrative. And she'll talk more about that. Um, just a couple of little housekeeping things. We invite you for the duration of the talk to keep your microphone on mute so that no background sounds will interfere with her talk. Um, if you have comments or questions, we invite you to use the chat feature. That way we will have a record of questions that may come up during the conversation and then we can address them at the end of the talk. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Tony. Um, and Tony, if you can unmute yourself and then I will spotlight you for everyone. Good afternoon. I'm going to apologize in advance because I, my internet is a bit unstable, but it's working okay now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to introduce my longtime friend and former colleague who will be our guest speaker this afternoon. Miriam Chambers has had a successful career in the financial services sector and was a senior president to the Scotia Bank. She was also the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities and the Minister of Children and Youth Services for the Government of Ontario. Community service has always been an integral part of Mary Ann's life. And in this regard, she has also served as Chair of the Board of the United Way of Canada, Vice Chair of the Government Council of the, of the University of Toronto, President of the Can Canadian Club of Toronto, Governor of the Air Collect Connect League of Canada, Vice Chair of the Rouge Valley Health System, President the Project for Advancement of Early Childhood Education Canada, Vice Chair of the Board of Canadian Charity Working Globally to End Poverty and Inequality by Sharing Skills to Build Stronger Futures, and the Minister of the Board University of 
Marianne is currently a governor of Canada's International Development Research Center, a senior fellow at York University's Glendon School of Public and International Affairs, a member of the External Advisory Board of the University of Guelph Institute of Development Studies, and a mentor with the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. She is also a director of Grace Kennedy Limited, a food and financial services group of companies traded on the Jamaica and Trinidad Stock Exchanges. For her outstanding contributions to the Canadian society, Miriam has been named to the Order of Ontario and Canada's Meritorious Service Medal. She has also been awarded the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa by the University of Toronto, York University, Lakehead University, and the University of Guelph. She is also the recipient of the Golden Jubilee and the Diamond Jubilee Medals, other awards, including the Prime Minister of Jamaica's Medal of Appreciation, the University of the West Indies Vice Chancellor's Award, and a YWCA Toronto Woman of Distinction Award. Miriam has also shown her tangible support for advancing the education of underprivileged youth by personally funding scholarships and bursaries for more than 60 university and college students in Ontario. In partnership with the University of Toronto at Scarborough, she has also sponsored and served as an advisor for the Imani Academic Mentorship Program, which benefited hundreds of middle and high school students. Friends, please join me in welcoming Dr. Marianne Chambers as our guest speaker this afternoon. Thank you, uh, Michelle, and thank you, Tony, uh, for your very kind introductions and for welcome, welcoming me to be with uh, your community today. Uh, I like you. Um, I'm enjoying this good weather. We have uh, been patiently waiting for it. And I know that uh, it's a bit of a sacrifice for you to be inside now. Uh, after this, I'm going to go work on something balcony pots. So, as Michelle mentioned, uh, the topic that I am using for my remarks today is changing the narrative, a reflection on the realities of anti-Black racism and prospects for the future. I hope you'll find uh, my remarks interesting. Some years ago, one of my favorite police chaplains, a very sweet older man and I conducted a little exchange of inspiring spiritual verses. He gave me one of the coins he carried in his pocket. I believe he usually gave those coins to police officers who sought his support and counsel. The coin carried two hands formed in prayer on one side, and on the other side, there was the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I, in turn, showed the chaplain the card that I had been carrying in my purse at Time. It contained words of the prophet Micah, which have long been a source of inspiration and a conscience for me. In Micah's words, this is what the Lord asks of you, only this, to act justly, to love tenderly, and to walk humbly with your God. I like the words of the prophet Micah because they tell us very clearly how we must conduct ourselves in our relationships with each other and with our God. 
in my view, the serenity prayer might give us excuses for not doing what we should be doing. Sometimes we decide that we are not able to make change where change is exactly what is needed. Us, we are afraid that the task might be too difficult or there might be risks involved. Feelings might be hurt, the status quo could be challenged, comfort zones might be disturbed. Thank you for the invitation to spend time with you today. It has been my observation that the strength of a community is determined by the commitment of its members to create an environment that provides opportunity for all to succeed. Tony Brathwaite and his wife, Margaret, have been the best of friends with my family for decades. They are truly lovely people who respect and lift others up regardless of who they happen to be or where they happen to be. The Cambridge Dictionary defines bias as the action of supporting or opposing a particular person or thing in an unfair way because of allowing personal opinions to influence your judgment. I am willing to acknowledge that I am biased in favor of Tony and Margaret. I think the world of them. Margaret, it's your birthday tomorrow, I remember. Happy birthday. Sometimes our biases are conscious. Sometimes they are unconscious. Our biases can be influenced by either negative or positive stereotypes. They can seem harmless or they can be manifested in ways that are hurtful, harmful, or even dangerous. From time to time, I am asked where I'm from or I'm told, I'm picking up an accent, what accent is that? That reveals an assumption that I'm not from Canada. It also reflects the fact that I'm not white. White people are not typically asked where they are from, even if their accent suggests that English is not their mother tongue. They are not as likely to be asked where they're from as I might be. So without further delay, let me tell you that I am a proud daughter of Jamaica. Let me also tell you that I am a proud Canadian who chose to call Canada my home 45 years ago. When my husband and I landed in Toronto along with our two little boys, I promised myself that we would be good for Canada and Canada would be good for us. Just a few weeks or so ago, a senior alumni uh, relations and development officer at an Ontario university told me he had recently met Brian, a partner in a large Toronto law firm. She told me, Brian is Jamaican, but he doesn't look Jamaican. I smiled as I recalled an experience I had in 1976, shortly after arriving in Canada and joining Scotiabank. I had been asking around for Dave, who had worked with my husband at IBM in Jamaica. My husband and I knew that Dave had joined the bank's information technology division in Toronto a couple of years before. And since I was also working in information technology at the bank, we thought it should be easy to locate Dave. None of my colleagues had heard of Dave. And one day, I guess a light went on for Bert, a fellow who worked in my area. Bert said, I know Dave. He's a white guy who talks like a black guy. I have been described as being an exception. I know that has been meant as a compliment, but it can also be interpreted as a slight against others who share some of my characteristics. When I have been described as an exception, I have responded by saying, I'm not an exception. You just don't know enough. 
I'm actually happy that people seem to feel comfortable saying these kinds of things to me. I use these as opportunities to expand their thinking, to change the narrative. A former Scotiabank colleague told me that I shouldn't be surprised if I didn't get very far. She had reasoned that I was a woman, a black woman, not Canadian born, Jamaican, married, a mother, and Roman Catholic. My colleagues shared just two of those identities, woman and mother. But she believed she could anticipate the challenges I would face. The year was 1976, and I had only recently made Canada my home. My colleague was actually ahead of her time. In more recent years, the term intersectionality has surfaced in reference to how overlapping social identities and impact an individual's life experiences. The identities that my colleague had observed were all accurate, but the conclusion that she had formed did not become my reality. Even now, when I think about that experience and my decision to ignore my colleague's caution, I know that she likely meant me no harm. Instead, I think she was trying to suggest that I manage my expectations. If our expectations are not too high, we're less likely to be disappointed when things don't go the way we would have hoped. But I did not think it was up to her to determine what I should expect. Yes. I am the black woman, not Canadian born, Jamaican married mother and Roman Catholic who shouldn't have been disappointed when I didn't get too far. But I was raised in a supportive environment where any barriers to my success resided primarily within me. Each little success gave me additional confidence, to aim higher, and to reach further. That helped to make me resilient to the point of being willing to dare others to challenge my right to succeed at whatever I set my mind to. I recognize that not everyone is as fortunate as I have been. That's why I believe it is important for each of us to reach out or respond to someone who might need our support, help them to realize the potential that resides within them. I was pleased to see the message from the Bishop's Committee on Intercultural Ministry, which included references to the part that we each play and the parts we must all play. The message also provided stats on the disproportionate impact of the justice system on black and indigenous people, and alluded to the systemic inequitable treatment of racialized students in our schools. Today, I would like to share with you how I believe the narrative can reach. Frederick Douglass, a celebrated 19th century American abolitionist born in slavery has been quoted as saying, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. It was the Honorable Justice Aston Hall who first introduced me. Justin Aston Hall had practiced as a criminal defense lawyer before being appointed to the bench in Ontario some years ago. This year, Justice Hall, a son of Jamaica, was appointed an associate chief in the Ontario court. In a particular week, while I was serving as Ontario's Minister of Training Colleges and Universities, I visited 
two Toronto schools located not more than about 10 minutes away from each other. The profile for one of the schools referred to the support the school received from parents and their community. That support had enabled them to equip their school with personal computers for all the students. I knew the other school would be quite different. Its profile revealed that the overwhelming majority of its students had been in Canada for less than five years. And for most, English was not their first language. I encouraged the students at both schools to dream big and to keep working towards the achievement of their dreams. Then I asked them to share their dreams with me. The students at the school that enjoyed strong support from their parents and their community needed no encouragement at all to tell me what they wanted to achieve. At the other school, I had to resort to bribery in the form of movie passes before the students would respond. But I was pleased to discover that they also had big dreams. Biologist, veterinarian, scientist, physician, and one boy wanted to be a professional basketball player. I was shocked when, as I was leaving the school, the principal took me aside and told me that it broke his heart to know that most of his students would not complete high school although they were smart enough to compete successfully against students their age who attended a well-known elite private school. He believed that few, if any at all, would go on to college or university. I asked him why he felt that way. He told me that the reason was that 67% of his students were from families living below the poverty line, and the others were from families that were just scraping. Building strong children with a kind of support that will go a long way towards helping them to achieve their potential is what the Imani Academic Mentorship Program at the University of Toronto Scarborough is all about. The acting principal of the University of Toronto Scarborough assigned Rochelle Lichmore the task of preparing proposals for my consideration. The year was 2007 and my last personal pledge of support to the university, which is my alma mater, had been fulfilled. That pledge had funded a fully accessible workstation in the new academic resource center. I had told the principal that my next commitment would need to be for an initiative that would make the university more relevant to young people in East Scarborough. I was approaching end of my term as a member of provincial parliament for Scarborough East. And while I had not yet revealed my decision, I knew I would not be seeking re-election. When Rochelle Lichmore came to Toronto from Jamaica to complete high school, she observed that many of the Black students at her school were not doing well. Statistics released by the Toronto District School Board confirmed that a very high percentage of Black students were not completing high school. Rochelle went on to study at the University of Toronto Scarborough and as president of the Black Students Association, worked with other members of the association to create an academic mentorship program for Black middle and high school students, where the mentors are high achieving Black students at the university and great role models for the younger mentees. On a visit to see how things were going with the Imani Academic Mentorship Program, I met a teacher, a white woman from one of the middle school 
schools in East Scotland, who had heard I would be dropping by. She told me that one of her students had invited her to see what he was doing at the university. He was actually the second student that she had referred to the program, as she had been so impressed by the positive impact the program had had on the first student. I thanked the teacher for recognizing that sometimes students need support beyond what teachers can provide in the classroom. I also thanked her for believing in the potential of her students. Her tear-filled eyes reflected how deeply emotional the experience had been. A janitor at the University of Blackman observed that Black kids would arrive at the university in groups and, in, and inquired as to what they were doing there. He shared with staff in student affairs that his daughter, Annie, had been told by one of her high school teachers that she would not be successful. And his father believed otherwise. And he asked the university's student affairs staff if his Annie could be allowed to participate in the program as a mentee, although she did not attend one of the schools that were participating in the program. Staff told Annie's father that she would be welcome. Annie graduated from high school and was accepted to study at the University of Toronto Scarborough. She became a mentor and ambassador for the Imani program while successfully pursuing her studies at the university. In 2015, the Toronto Community Foundation's annual Vital Science Report recognized the Imani Academic Mentorship Program as an innovative initiative pointing the way forward for Toronto. More than 1,000 middle and high school students have participated in the Imani Program. When I am asked to speak at Black History Month events, I use the opportunity to illustrate that Black history is everyone's history. I know that to be the case because as I name Black women and men who have for a very long time been active in the sciences, technology, engineering, and mathematics, I have to cut the list short. I might only mention that black women and men have invented the artificial heart pacemaker control unit, the multiplex telegraph used to send messages between train stations and moving trains, the laser faker probe for removing cataracts, which has helped to save the eyesight of millions of people and has even restored the sight of people had been blind for more than 30 years. The 3D graphics technology used in movies, the gas mask that was used to rescue 32 men trapped during an explosion in an underground tunnel 250 feet on the Lake Erie. The process of synthesis, which led to improvements in the production of cortisol ultraviolet camera spectrograph, which was on board Apollo 16 when it traveled to the moon in 1972, enabling researchers to study Earth science. The imaging X-ray spectrometer, whose inventor was named the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center Innovator of the Year in 1984. Mathieu de Costa worked as an interpreter for French explorers and settlers in the early 17th century. Elijah McCoy invented lubrication systems for locomotives in the 19th century, resulting in the term the rail McCoy being used to symbolize genuine quality. Black regiments from Canada served Britain during the First World War even before that, William Hall 
a 19th century soldier from Nova Scotia, was the first black person in the world to receive the Victoria Cross, the highest military honor in the British Commonwealth. The impact that those individuals and many others have had on the lives of people of all races makes black history everyone's. In every sector of society, in every industry, trade and profession, black people are making huge contributions and are helping make life better for everyone. Here's a really tiny current day sample from the field of medicine. Dr. Upton Allen is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. He's also the division head for infectious diseases and interim head of the Transplant and Regenerative Medicine Center at Toronto's hospital. Born in Jamaica and a graduate of the University of the West Indies, Dr. Allen is the first Canadian to have been recognized with the American Society of Transplantation Clinical Science Established Investigator Award. He has also been awarded an honorary fellowship by the Royal College of Physicians in the United Kingdom for his work in training specialists from around the world. In Saudi Arabia, former trainees of Dr. Allen have established visiting profession, uh, professions, professorships in his name. At McMaster University, Dr. Juliet Daniel, a daughter of Barbados, is professor and cancer biologist in the Department of Biology. In the laboratory that she established at McMaster, Dr. Daniel, herself a cancer survivor, is leading a team of researchers focused on colon cancer and also on aggressive and difficult to treat triple negative breast cancer. Prior to joining McMaster some 20 years ago, Dr. Daniel did postdoctoral work in the USA, unearthing and cloning a protein that regulates genes that control cell proliferation and the progression of prostate cancer. At Carleton University, Jamaican-born Dr. Pat uh, Patrice is Dean of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies. She is a full professor in the Department of Neuroscience, where her internationally recognized research specializes in understanding how the brain responds to injury and mechanisms to promote repair and recovery. We have all come to know Dr. Eileen Devella, Chief Medical Officer of Health for the City of Toronto, but you might not be aware that Dr. Nekochi Lamti, a, big, a black woman, has recently been appointed Deputy Medical Officer for the City of Toronto. I will share with you that my mom was very disappointed that I did not choose medicine as a profession. Let me forget that. I tried to convince myself that I might be making a difference anyway. While no one will ever see me in scrubs providing care in an emergency department, intensive care unit, or operating room, someone might need my blood for transfusion one day. I hope the need, need never arises for any of you or for your loved ones, but given that my blood is the relatively rare O negative type, I am a universal donor and I accept that responsibility with pride and pleasure. It's possible that my blood could help to improve someone's quality of life, or perhaps even save their life. I'm hoping my mom will give me a little bit of credit. In the world of business, Rob Davis, a black man, has recently been appointed chair of the board of KPMG. 
And this month, Cornell Wright, former partner at Tories LLP, becomes executive vice president of the holding company that's the major shareholder of Loblaw Group of Companies. It has already been announced that in January 2022, Cornell will become president of that. You might already know Cornell Wright as chair of the board of the National Ballet of Canada, where the leg legendary Karen Kay is artistic. Jimmy Jean is Desjardins' new chief economist after having been their senior economist for 10 years. Quebec-based Desjardins is the largest federation of credit unions in North America. A very wise person once told me that it is not how others treat us, but rather how we treat others that defines When I hear people say they are colorblind, I figure they must be approaching 100 years of age. There was a time when that comment might have resonated in some circles, but that simply isn't enough now. To say that one is not a racist is also not a meaningful position. Tell me you are opposed to racism, that you know racism is wrong, if you want me to have any confidence in your sincerity. Tell me how you are going to live your life so that others can live their lives. Listening to my granddaughters as they describe how they are engaging with their white friends on the issue of anti-Black racism gives me Seeing the diversity in the ages and races of people who are participating in protests against racism gives me the clarity of the thinking, the determination, and the fearlessness of the actions of young people of all races give me reason to be hopeful. Never before has that been more evident or more powerful. People who had it ignored or dismissed the voices of those who have long been saying that Black Lives Matter are now kneeling in support of their message. The work of past movements served to change and repeal abhorrent laws. That was absolutely critical for any progress to be made. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was branded as a radical by those determined to protect the status quo. Today, now I am very likely speaking to people who already get it. I doubt that there are any of you who are here because you need to be educated about the existence or the evils of racism. Thank you for caring enough to spend your valuable time on a topic that you already know and care about. What we need from those who are not already entirely committed to opposing racism is a change in attitudes. And there is greater insistence that there be accountability how we act towards each other, both individually and collectively in the form of institutionalized. Unfortunately, it's harder to legislate that kind of change. It might be inconvenient for some to recognize that dominant society and dominant culture continue to determine based on their own experiences and privileges, how everyone else gets to live. While it is important to acknowledge that reality, it might be even more important to recognize that the institutionalization of public policies and how they are implemented is all within the control of human beings. I think this is important to remember when we talk about systemic racism. 
are even simply about the system. Perhaps when we think of systems as the problem, we should remember these systems might be created by people eager to establish or protect what they deem to be their rights, as opposed to, and sometimes at the expense of, what they think is good enough for everyone else. My question for those who say they're not racist, but do not go as far as opposing racism is, what are you afraid? Today, with our particular focus on anti-Black racism, it's important to address why things must be different going forward. The answer, in my view, is not simply about social good or correcting historical wrongs, but also about the value to society and the quality of life we all seek to enjoy. It is a loss and a cost to society as a whole when Black people are not given access to opportunities to pursue and achieve their potential to contribute. So, if you encounter racist comments or behavior, I encourage you to speak up against what you have heard or witnessed. If you observe situations that are not inclusive, Ask why that is so and how that might be. And if you are able to support Black youth who need a mentor or an introduction that might result in them gaining access to opportunities that they otherwise would not have, consider stepping in to help make that happen. There are steps that we each can take to help the narrative. The commitment that we all need to make is to respect that we all deserve to be able to live with dignity and in ways that do not involve the oppression of others. It has never been more important to protect, preserve, and promote our humanity. We're each a work in progress, yet to be perfected. Most of us have yet to achieve our full potential. I think that means we should never stop trying to be better human beings and the socially responsible beings I believe we were created. That must include being each other's leaders, taking care of each other to the very best of our ability and making our privilege. Thank you so much for hearing me out. Here we go, I'm gonna unmute myself. Can you all hear me now? Hello. Um, so I, I'd like to thank uh, Marianne Chambers for speaking today uh, and so eloquently sharing your experience with us and challenging us um, that in fact, it's not enough to not be racist, but in fact, there is more work to be done to be anti-racist and in our own context to, to change the narrative. And you've given, um, I know, for me, at least a lot of a lot of food for thought, as well as a lot of examples, uh, concrete examples um, on how we in our own context can can grow and change to become uh, better friends, allies in a more inclusive and caring community. So I, I thank you for sharing with us today. Uh, at this time, uh, we'll invite anyone who has questions. You can either use the raise hand feature um, that is a button, or you can raise your hand uh, on your screen so that I can see it. Or you can also type your question in the chat feature, and then we can um, allow uh, Mary Ann to address it. So are there any questions? And, and 
feel free to unmute yourself as well. I'm gonna move over to gallery view so that I can see if there are any, any questions. Looks like Mary Bartle has a question. So Mary, if you can unmute yourself. I, I was trying to put it in chat, but I'm wondering where in Micah is this quote uh, that Mary Ann Chambers had? This is what the Lord asks of you. Um, where is that in Micah? Oh, Mary, well, I, um, I don't have the, um, I don't have the, the, the actual That's verse okay. or. I, I'll Google, I, I will Google. Yes, yes, it's, it's, um, it's, not, it's not a quote that is typically unfamiliar. It's it's a pretty it's a pretty commonly um, uh, quoted piece, and it's I, I think one of the things I like about it is is that it's so clear, so simple. This is what the Lord asks of you: only this, to act justly, to love tenderly, and to walk humbly with your God. And and I think you know we're all up to that. It's it. I like it. Well, I'll I'll Google to find out where that is. Oh yeah, just just as posted it. It's Micah six verse eight. It oh. was actually our elections, not today, but last Sunday. Oh, wait, no, no, thank no. you, Jess. When Wednesday evening, I preached on it. Um, but yeah, Micah six verse eight. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Any other questions? Scroll through. Or comments or reflections. Doesn't necessarily need to be a question either. Uh, looks like John Knowles. John, if you want to unmute yourself. Okay. Well, that isn't a question. I just wanted to remark on the fact that I've noticed during the pandemic how many of the specialists that are interviewed or asked for comments or advice on TV news programs are people of colour. I think it's indicative of the huge contribution that people of colour have made to this country. Most of them probably either not born here or of parents who, who were born here but the parents who came from overseas. I think it's a huge, I really admire the contribution and I feel so thankful for it. That's really all I have to say about that. I, no, I agree, John. I agree. And um, there is so much more than we are seeing. The other, the other, uh, the other thing I can, can uh, say is that in medical schools in this country, a lot of the professors are people of color and people who have been trained elsewhere. So they're, they're also building the capacity of our system, not just through their own individual contributions, but by what they are imparting to others. Yes, as a matter of fact, a very close family member of mine spent a couple of weeks in hospital earlier this year, and most of the people who cared for her were people of colour. And you know, I yes. just, I just so thankful to them for the work they do. She wasn't, she, she didn't have COVID. It was something else. But it was, yeah. it was a, it was just the, the, the medical system could not, could not operate without people of colour. So true. So true, thank you for that. Thank you, thank you everybody. Okay. So can you see if there are any other questions? Well, I just wanted to comment. Oh, it looks like Paul, Paul, uh, Paul Wing and Joan Humphreys. So right. uh, we'll do Paul first and then Joan. Okay. Um, firstly, hello to all my friends at uh, St. George's. Um, I wanted to, if I may, tell you a little story about Marianne, because I've known Marianne for almost 40 years. Uh, we Paul has been together. a very, very good friend. Yeah, we worked together at Scotiabank for over 20 years and spent too many hours in meetings together <laughs> around the executive table. And the one thing about Marianne is that she... She walks the talk and always has. She's, she helped taught me, teach me a lot about humility and humanity. And 
Um, Scotiabank being one of the largest uh, international banks in the world, brought in a lot of people like Tony and Margaret and Marianne and many, many others from the Caribbean and integrated those that wanted to be integrated into the business and seemed to do it seamlessly. The story I wanted to tell, if I may, is when Mary was right, Marianne was running for election in Scarborough Guildwood, which is where I also lived in the riding. And I had the privilege to go and campaign for her. I hated it. I hated knocking on doors. I hated making telephone calls. But I was so proud of knowing Mary Ann and so tired of the white male corruption of the politicians in that area, because the previous MP, I think, had gone to jail. Um, you may remember that better than I do, Mary Ann. That I saw Mary Ann as someone who would be a breath of fresh air in our riding and more suitable to represent all of the people there, all of us including us that lived in the white enclaves of Guildwood. Um, I one day was out canvassing for her and one of the very last doors I knocked on of one of my neighbors, not someone I knew, the lady asked me, I don't know anything about Marianne. Can you tell me something about her? And the final question this lady has was, does Mary ha Marianne have a degree? And I said, I don't know the answer to that, but I will get her to call you. That evening, Mary Ann called this person. And I'm proud to say that that poll that I lived in, we won by one vote. Because Mary Ann reached out to the people of uh, uh, Scarborough Guildwood, got herself elected by who she is and reaching out to all the people within, within our riding and representing all the people. I, I'm proud to have known her for all this period of time and for all that she's achieved. And I've learned one heck of a lot from, from her. Thank you, Mary Ann, for doing this this afternoon for my friends at St. George's. And thank you, Tony, for a wonderful introduction. You're going to make me cry for <laughs> Thank you so much. That's so kind. You're welcome. So generous. My privilege. And Joan, did you have a question? Um, well, I would just like to say thank you. It was a very powerful talk. I'm sorry that the people of color haven't come uh, in the forefront with all the things they do and all the history that is behind people of color. And I admire you so much and thank you for educating me this afternoon. I'm glad I joined. Thank you so much, thank Joan. You, you know, um, I, when, I, when I thought of the, the topic change in the narrative, uh, I did so because uh, we hear a lot of the trauma stories, which are absolutely for real. Mm -hmm. And and I think that we need to also recognize that given the opportunities, the outcome can be really positive, not just for those individuals, but for all of us, for the entire society. And so uh, in, in changing the narrative, I'm also thinking of how I see young people, youth, thinking about this issue. And, and I, I want to make sure um, to the extent that I can, that, that people are not seeing charity cases, that people are seeing opportunity, that people are seeing potential. And, and sometimes in life, every one of us, uh, has an experience that demonstrates that we can't do everything that we need to do by ourselves. Uh, and sometimes we really do have to um, either reach out or accept or be supported by others. And, and, and that's what I mean when I say 
we need to make our privilege matter because I think all of us in some way, shape or form has some kind of privilege as in something that can be of benefit, uh, not only to ourselves, but to others. And, and I personally find that it feels really good to be able to do that, really good to be able to make someone else's life a little bit more livable. Thank you. James has a question. Yeah. Um, oh, hang on, just one second here. I'm trying to do three things at once here. Um, Marianne, thank you for everything that you've you've said. I'll I'll, I'll echo that um, as well. But um, what what I really liked about what you've been saying in terms of changing that narrative is 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 the fact that we're not you know focused on on all of the terrible because there's plenty of terrible, right? You know, but the um, but I guess one of the things that I've often found frustrating, and in a lot of I, I work with the youth of the parish, and like I know that a lot of the youth when we've had these conversations and, and they're having the same conversations that your grandkids are having and and all of and all of the rest of it. I think one of the things that um that I think is so frustrating, right, is that is that the world in or people in defending, you know, that they are not um racist, that they're that we're not uh, that their that their actions were not intentionally uh, degrading or whatever it happens to be and defending that like their decisions, their privilege, their behavior, right? They're actively resisting changing that narrative, right? And I think that's the that's difficult because then you get into the what aboutism and like, you know, well, what about this? And what about that? Well, what about that? Like, you know, like what about this? Right. And so my question to you really is you've you've changed the narrative for us, which is fantastic. But in a lot of spaces that we're in, that my youth are in, or that the people that you're talking to right now are in, there may not be as many people of color who can actively, you know, impart that. And what can we do? Like, far be it for me to say, like, you can solve it and give us, like, the actual playbook. But, but what are simple things that people can do to actively change that narrative, right? You know, to actively support changing how people are thinking about things or how they're talking. Thanks for the question and for your thoughtfulness, James. Uh, you know, sometimes, uh, well, first, first of all, I should say that uh, there, there is this saying, uh, once you have seen or once you've experienced, you cannot unsee or you cannot forget that experience. And, and I think sometimes, uh, sometimes people who are not actively committed to changing something that needs to be changed uh, might feel intimidated about their ability to make a thing. And yet, sometimes it's the little things that can make a difference. It's that little acknowledgement, that little sign um, of respect that we each matter. Um, and, and, and it doesn't have to be a huge thing. And, and each little step or each little acknowledgement, each little sign of respect for someone else, I think it goes such a long way. And I think it, it feeds more of that. And, and maybe one of the reasons why it has that kind of effect um, it's because for people who do those little things, it actually feels good. And, uh, and, and so it, it, it feeds on itself. So I would, I would say, uh, rather than being specific about do this or do that or do the other thing, I would say to your youth, just think about how you would like to be. Just think about how in whatever situation you would have liked um, the experience to have been different or, or positive or whatever. Could you do that? More than likely you. And what a huge difference it would be. Hmm.
Any other questions? And James, thanks for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Let's scroll through. It looks like Mary's got another question. Mary, please unmute yourself. You're muted, Mary. Okay. The reason that I'm um, speaking again is that I live near a high school. I live at Islington and Dundas. There's a high school nearby. I see young people uh, walking by and they are of mixed race. They're, they all seem to get along together, I guess. So that's kind of good. Okay, I just wanted to say that I have seen that. Mary, I agree with you, and and I, you know, I made some of those observations in in my remarks as well, and that gives me hope. Yes, yes. that gives me hope for mm -hmm. real. And and I've heard stories. I've heard stories about parents who say things or think nothing of whatever. And when they have been uh, challenged, if you like, they've gone home and talked to their, their, their kids. And their kids have said, oh, this is obvious. And they have been big enough to go back. I am thinking of particular conversations that I've heard about. And they, are, they have been big enough to go back and say, you know what, talk to my kids. And now I realize what we're talking about. And, and I think, um, I do believe that we also have to remember we are all humans and we have feelings and we don't like people to, to accuse us of doing things that we don't think we're doing wrong. And so it's, it's, uh, it's normal to have that kind of um, automatic defensive reaction, if you like. Uh, but I think if we give ourselves a chance uh, to have things settle and to be open to considering what, uh, what's going on in our little private spaces. In our small, yes. Yeah, I, I yeah. I say, now I know I also have just the international blood. So now I know if I ever, I'll say, oh, please, please contact Marianne Chambers. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully there is a story or two in what I shared that you might find useful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and I really appreciated your opening reflection, both on the serenity prayer um, about how it it can actually when particularly when facing systemic racism when it's an entire system it, it can be easy in a way and say what can little me do in the face of all that and you know the serenity to you know accept the things we cannot change and you know sort of let ourselves off the hook um, but I'm also thinking about that in, in connection with what you said about uh, Fred Le Frederick Douglass's quote about it's easier to build strong children than to fix broken, broken men, men. And, um, or women, I guess, but it was when he was writing. Um, <laughs> but um, I guess for me, the, the reflection on that is it's, it's within every one of our hands to do both. Um, which is to actively work on fixing our own brokenness and our own place in supporting the system that currently exists, as well as helping to raise up a next generation who are even more open-minded and inclusive um, than our existing one. And it's uh, just kind of a reminder that it's always a work in progress and one that we, we do because we're people of faith. Um, mm -hmm. I am 70 and I am a work in progress. I know that for sure. Uh, me too. <laughs> I, think, I think we all are in it. You know, I mean, it goes back to that Micah quote, right? It's do, do justice, love kindness and, and be humble. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we all take a posture of humility, um, it, it helps to change that narrative and, and creates the opportunity for all of us to be participants. So I, 
I really appreciate your words and your reflections today. Michelle, if we have time for another question, I, I see a hand up. Um, it's the name is Michael Ware, but it's a lady. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am a lady. <laughs> Some of the time. <laughs> so yeah, I just like to comment as well. We have three children. Uh, one of them is 30 and the, another one is 27 and the other one is 24. And the younger they get, the more inclusive <laughs> they seem to be and to the point where I just got so used to having a room full of people and half of the kids in the room are of color, not necessarily black, they may be Indian, they may be whatever. And it was really, really refreshing to see that. And also just to, one would say, you know, you know, so-and-so is gay and, and it'd be like, yeah, what's the, what's the, what's the big deal, mom? <laughs> like get over it. Right. And it's just like, it's, it's kind of, it's really refreshing to see the younger generation just kind of like, they're almost shocked that it's like, it even crosses your mind. <laughs> and I'm not saying that that's the case in every single milieu or whatever, but I have noticed it a lot in a lot of, uh, there's just a lot of my my kids friends that are mixed they're mixed couples they're mixed race they're mixed religions there are some are gay some are straight and they just don't care and i think that's fantastic so let me congratulate you because we've been talking about how wonderful uh young people are and how much hope we get uh from we, we can get from 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 our young people but I think you need to take some credit as well because you have raised your children well, obviously. And even if it means you have allowed them to help you move along, I congratulate you. And I'm reminded of what one of my, one of my sons is a pilot, but when he was a little guy, um, well, I guess early teens, we were waiting to board a flight. Uh, you know, heading off on a trip. And as the crew were walking towards uh, the bridge to our airplane, I realized the captain was a woman. <laughs> and, and I said to my friend, and it was just, yeah. oh, we have a female captain. And my son looked at me and said, what's the big deal? If she wasn't qualified, she wouldn't be a captain. <laughs> And, and um, you know, that was like him pulling me back and saying, you know, what, what, what's wrong with you, Ma? And my response was, was to say, well, I'm so glad I raised you well, because that's the kind of attitude you're supposed to have. That was my immediate defense mechanism, you know. Sure. But, but, you know, we see this is, this is progress and we should recognize and appreciate progress. And, and, and like I say, congratulations, because you are helping to make that um, a reality. I would like to make one other comment that might give you some peace of mind. So I'm probably maybe sixth generation Canadian. Uh, I'm as blonde as you can get and as white as you can get. And I get asked on a weekly basis, where do I come from? Is that right? <laughs> and they go, let me guess, you must be Norwegian. You yeah, must yeah. be like from England. And I'm like, Actually, no, I'm Canadian. <laughs> but they always try to pick off, where do I come from? <laughs> yeah. And they go, uh, I'm Canadian. Oh, all right. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, sometimes small talk gets us into trouble. Yeah. Um, I remember at, um, uh, at one of my son's weddings, uh, his, his, uh, his, his bride's uncle, had come from South Africa for the wedding. And background is Dutch, okay? Holland yeah. Dutch. And at, at the wedding reception, um, he took my daughter-in-law aside and said, do you know Stefan is black? And she said, no, really? <laughs> 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 so I think sometimes small talk gets us into trouble. <laughs> you know, you kind of 
what, what's the saying? Um, <laughs> mouth, mouth in action before brain gets into gear kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So true. So thank you very much. You've been, uh, it's been great. <laughs> very enlightening. Thank you for having me. I appreciate, I appreciate uh, your time with me. You could be doing all sorts of other things and uh, it means a lot that you, you have spent this time on this topic. Thank you. You've been a joy to listen to. Um, and a lot of what you've shared with us, I know, is, is for me, food for thought and inspiring. And I'm already thinking about things that we can be doing. Um, and I thank you for taking the time to spend with us on this beautiful day as well and, and sharing uh, your reflections and your experiences with us. So uh, thank you on behalf of everyone at St. George's and those uh, who have tuned in from further afield. Um, thank you. My pleasure. Keep well. And, uh, okay, well, God bless you and everyone. And um, I think James will end the recording. And um, thank you and enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. Take care, everyone. Keep well. Thank you. All right. Thank you.